It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the ninth annual conference on innovations in tobacco control and regulatory science to decrease cigarette smoking. Um, we're really happy that you could be with us this morning. So uh, I'm Steve Higgins and I direct the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. It's hosting this conference. Um, and I wanna thank um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the Food and Drug Administration, National Institute on General Medical Sciences and uh, the University of Vermont for their generous support and allowing us to host these conferences. Um, so so uh, we're gonna focus, as I already uh, mentioned, on uh, cigarette smoking. And the reason is that it's the leading cause of preventable disease in the US um, that's responsible for greater than 480,000 deaths every year. Um, and then a conservative estimate, more than 5 million globally. It increases risk for a wide range of diseases, coronary heart disease, stroke, COPD, lung and other site-specific cancers. So we um, just need to innovate and remain focused on this terrible epidemic that <laughs> has been with us for many, many decades. Um, and we have to improve and expand upon our tobacco control and regulatory efforts to stamp out cigarette smoking. So the next two days, we're gonna hear from experts engaged in just those efforts that will allow us to realize the aims of ridding ourselves of cigarette smoking. So um, I had a, the opportunity to look at one of the um, U.S. Uh, national surveys on drugs and, and smoking. And it's the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Most recent issue was available reporting on uh, cigarette smoking in 2019. So um, there's, there's a lot of progress that's been made. Um, so current smoking, that is the person reports uh, smoking in the past month in the U.S. among those 12 years and older decreased from a prevalence of 26% or 61.1 million um, people in the United States 12 years and older in 2002 who were reporting current smoking down to 16.7 or 45, uh, essentially 46 million in 2019. That's a 36% decrease in prevalence. So that's terrific. And then even more exciting in a positive direction, current smoking in US adolescents, those 12 to 17 years old, declined from 13% in, or 3.2 million in 2002 to 2.3%, 572 million, a half a million in 2019. That's an 82% decrease in prevalence. And I wanna point out that that rate in 2019 at 2.3%, while not significantly different from 2018, which is around the, the same um, percent, those are record lows um, in the history of smoking for, for our US adolescents. Um, and so that's, that's a tremendous accomplishment. So then why today, what, the next two days, why focus on smoking? Well, um, considerable and laudable accomplishment, but there are still 46 million current smokers, 12 years of age or older in the US and many, many more millions globally, which just, you know, we know enough about it that it promises tremendous catastrophic ongoing and perfectly preventable morbidity, mortality and economic burden. Um, along with disparate impacts on vulnerable populations, this, this burden is not borne equally uh, throughout our, um, the U.S. or, or globally. It, it really impacts our most disadvantaged populations. So my position, and I think it's one that I'm, I'm guessing is shared by the audience, we can and must do better. And that's what we're going to focus on for the next two days. So uh, we do offer continuing medical education credits for this conference. And so we have to uh, share this disclaimer. And then I had the privilege of introducing um, a, a, 
our uh, university uh, provost and senior vice president, Dr. Patricia Prelock, who has generously agreed to uh, give some opening remarks. Um, Dr. Prelock is the, um, as I mentioned, a provost, senior vice president, and also professor of communication sciences and disorders and professor of pediatrics in Alarner College of Medicine here at the University of Vermont. Um, so in short, in addition to being an outstanding administrator, uh, Dr. Prelock is also a distinguished scholar um, in the area of the development and testing of parent training programs for caregivers of children with autism spectrum disorder. She's received many millions of dollars in university, state, and federal funding uh, to develop innovations in care in this important area of health. She has an extensive publication record on the topic and has received numerous university, regional, and national awards for her scholarship. So as an investigator under her leadership, I can tell you it's wonderful to have administrators who are also uh, excellent and accomplished scientists. So I'm thrilled that Dr. Prelock has taken time from her very busy schedule to provide opening remarks on this year's um, VCBH conference. And so Patty, my sincere thanks for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Steve. And I've been following Dr. Higgins' work since um, I came to UVM and I've been following the incredible activity that's happening in the Vermont Center for Behavioral Health. And so I'm thrilled to be here. So Steve has kind of given us the framework for tobacco use, but I was doing some homework in preparation for uh, speaking with you this morning. And as many of you know, the NIH describes the science of behavior change as this systematic approach to discovering the high and the why of the how and the why behind behavior change. And so unhealthy behaviors such as smoking, which we're going to be focusing on today, certainly contribute, as Steve identified, to negative health outcomes. Yet effective interventions for ensuring healthy behaviors still need to be examined at a greater level. And for those interventions that do appear to lead to behavior change, seldom do we know why or how they worked, although Steve and his colleagues and team have done a good job of getting us closer. And it's so important that we improve our understanding of the how and why of behavior change as this will really create a pathway to the most reliable public health interventions, which is really something in my current role as administrator, I care a lot about. As a first step, you know, it's really important to improve our understanding of those primary elements that are responsible for behavior change across a range of health-related behaviors, such as smoking, for which the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health has been a leader. And as we consider some of these elements of behavior change, like self-regulation or stress reactivity and resilience and interpersonal and social processes, many of which you'll hear about today, the complexities of reducing the adverse impact of cigarette smoking, I think, continues to become clearer. In fact, the CDC tells us that quitting smoking is one of the most important actions people can take to improve the health of our population, regardless of age or how long someone has been smoking. So as I was reflecting on all the research being done under Dr. Higgins' leadership in the area of smoking cessation, I realized the larger contribution that he, his team, and their collaborators are making to a, a critical public health area. And, and the CDC points out the following health opportunities for smoking cessation. And this is gonna to relate to our larger vision at the university for building healthy societies um, and healthy communities. So we know it can improve health status and enhances quality of life, reduces the risk of premature death and can add as much as 10 years to life expectancy, reduces the risk of many adverse health effects, including poor reproductive health outcomes, cardiovascular diseases, um, COPD and cancer, benefits people already diagnosed, as Steve said, with coronary heart disease or COPD, 
It benefits the health of pregnant women and their fetuses and babies, which I know Steve has also been so focused on. And it reduces the financial burden that smoking places on people who smoke our healthcare service systems and our society. It's becoming more and more clear that not smoking is the best single way to protect our family members, our coworkers, friends, and others from the health risks associated with breathing and secondhand smoke. I can clearly remember as my dad, um, who's no longer living, was a smoker, and I used to say to him, not in the house, not near me, and this is why it's so important that you don't do this. So clearly smoking cessation is a core area for public health research and, and more specifically, it's an area of research that is a specific priority for our center here. And it's tied to our research mission at the University of Vermont. One of our key aspects of our strategic vision for the university is what we call investing in our distinctive research strengths. A UVM education provides a powerful combination of the liberal arts core and a comprehensive academic resources to ensure that we have a major research institution. This dual nature has really positioned us well to engage our faculty scholars across disciplines to be innovative in their discovery of new knowledge. And this is key to our university's reach and our reputation. We've built distinctive research strengths that align with the urgent and interdependent need to support the health of our environment and our societies, as I mentioned earlier. In building healthy societies, which is part of our larger strategic vision that our president Suresh Garamella identified, we actually thought a lot about the collaboration across disciplines from immunology, microbiology, data mining, mapping, analysis, ethics, historical context, and communication. But we were also thinking about um, a healthy society focus is driven by the excellence in research that is actually occurring in smoking cessation that you're gonna hear about today and much of the work that Steve has been leading, as well as our efforts in substance abuse prevention and rehabilitation, immunobiology, uh, infectious disease treatment, microbiology, vaccine testing, and other public health campaigns. In our efforts at the University of Vermont to support healthy environments, our faculty, our researchers, and practitioners across disciplines are collaborating to create new knowledge and establish best practices in things like sustainable farming, food systems, business solutions, and the protection of water systems. We're also leveraging our engineering, machine learning, and complex system strengths to develop scalable solutions. So the intersection between these areas, building healthy societies and ensuring healthy environments provides numerous opportunities for our researchers for investigation, innovation, and the impactful discovery with economic, ethical, pol policy, and public health considerations. Cultivating our research strengths in these areas will certainly leverage the unique characteristics of Vermont, which can serve as a sort of microcosm for national programs to be piloted at a manageable scale. The role of the Vermont Center on Behavioral and Health has been integral to helping the University of Vermont focus on building healthy communities and healthy environments through its smoking sensation, cessation work. I am most proud of their work on preventing behaviors that compromise the health of the individual and the public. And I know you will be inspired by the knowledge creation and implementation that will be discussed here today. I'm confident that through the work of Dr. Higgins, the researchers that he has mentored, many of those you will hear from today and the outstanding strength and innovation of the center that we will further our advances in this critical area of public health that requires our immediate and ongoing attention. As Steve mentioned, we're moving the dial in the right place, but we still have a ways to go. And I can't think of it being in better hands um, than Dr. Higgins and his team and collaborators. So thanks so much, Steve, for this opportunity. And I hope you have a fantastic conference.
Thank you, Patty, for those generous comments and, and insights into uh, behavior and health. We, we really appreciate it. Um, thanks again. Okay, so um, we are also um, very fortunate to have some opening remarks from the senior person of the um, uh, Vermont delegation to the US Congress, uh, U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy, and um, I'm going to, it's a video, he is um, unable to be with us due to his busy schedule, but I'm going to play the video now. Welcome. It's the ninth annual conference on behavior change, health, and health disparities. It's been sponsored by the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health. I really feel honored to welcome each of you to the University of Vermont and to this important two-day conference. I'll say right at the beginning, I'm grateful that UVM has provided us a safe way to meet and discuss these important issues. You know, the Vermont Center on Behavior and Health plays an important role. It raises awareness of major health epidemics in Vermont but also across the country. Together, look what you've done. You've researched remedies for the opiate crisis, obesity, and how to deliver health care to our most vulnerable communities. If the past year and a half of living through the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us anything, it's the public health crises require leadership and bold action. And this cannot be done without the help of our research community. And I'm very grateful for your guidance and expertise, but that you provide policymakers. You've given them the information we need to make the best decisions for our constituents. I look at that as chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee. And on that committee, I remain committed to seeing that every community receives the resources it needs to address these challenges. This year's conference will focus on the ongoing fight to decrease tobacco use and cigarette smoking. I remember a couple of years ago, I gave remarks on this topic. At that time, tobacco use among teens was of the utmost concern. This alarming trend among adolescents was attributed to one tobacco product, electronic cigarettes. And I'm proud to say today that a number of congressional actions have led to a significant decrease in nicotine vaping over these past two years. This included passing legislation that I strongly support, such as raising the tobacco age to 21 and limiting the online sale of nicotine vaping devices. In September, the Food and Drug Administration also denied approval of nearly 95, or I'm sorry, 950,000 e-cigarette products, many advertising flavors such as cinnamon toast and apple crumble. And of course, they're marketed towards children. But you know from your own research, much more can and should be done to curb cigarette smoking, particularly among youths. Addiction cannot be solved overnight, but we can all do our best to further efforts on prevention. Nearly all tobacco product use begins in adolescence. We must do more as a community. We have to educate the youth about the dangers of e-cigarettes. We have to limit dangerous claims made by the tobacco industry and its marketing. That requires a whole community approach. There's gonna be buy-in from teachers and parents and doctors and the incredible youth advocates who stepped up in the past few years to share their stories because they influence their peers. And in Congress, I'll continue to push for common sense measures, measures that can curb the teen use of e-cigarettes, such as stopping manufacturers from selling youth-friendly flavors. But there's other things we have to do. We have to continue to bolster our public health system. 
I'm proud that after four years of battling, significant cuts have been proposed to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The President Biden has come in and instead of cuts, he's requested an historic investment in the agency. Uh, I've told the president I'll work with Mr. Chairman of Appropriations to make this funding a reality. The lives of Americans are worth these federal investments, but so is your research. So thank you once again for your dedication to improving the lives of others through public health promotion. And both Marcel and I wish you all the best for a very successful conference. Thank you. Great. My sincere thanks to Senator Leahy and his staff for taking the time to put together that video. It's detailed, it's thoughtful, and also for uh, the Senator's leadership on these important issues in the, in the US Senate. So many, many thanks. So now we are able to move to our paper sessions. The first one, uh, listed here that's going to be chaired by my colleague and friend, Jennifer Tidy. And so I'm going to turn over the reins to Jennifer from here. So we'll have a five minute break and oh. then Jennifer will take over in the next Zoom session. So we'll see everyone there. I didn't realize we were taking a break. Thank you. Yep, just five minutes yep. for everyone to move over. <laughs> 